What up, crew? Great to have you here at the card table. I'm your host, Vineet, aka Card Mechanic. And on this show, we interview magicians, cardists, YouTubers, and more. So, let's do it. Today, I'm going to be sitting down with one of my biggest inspirations. His card handling skills are just unparalleled. So, give it up for the greatest card mechanic, Richard Turner. Hey, Richard. Great to have you here at the card table. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, very well with that. I do appreciate you inviting me. I'm honored. I, I can't even tell you how much of an honor it is for me to have you on here. When I initially reached out to you, I had I had honestly no idea what to expect, but um, I, I really do have to give a, a special shout out to uh, John Prada, who I think emailed you first. Yes, he did. And uh, then because of him, I was able to reach out to you and uh, set this up. So I'm absolutely honored to have you on today. Well, here we are, and we're going to have fun together. Absolutely. So um, whenever I start these off, I always have people introduce themselves, but I feel like most of my audience, if not all, already know who you are. So I kind of wanted to start off a little differently. And um, I actually spent most of today watching uh, your, doc doc your documentary, Delt, and breaking it down just a little bit at a time. So just to have a bit more refreshment. So I know you, you when you, uh, in the documentary, you talked about um, growing up, and uh, you watched the show uh, Maverick that really kind of got you started with uh, with uh, what you do now, cheating at cards. So could you kind of talk about um, how that molded you to start off with uh, what well, you do now? Well, we were a very poor family. We had four games, Monopoly, chess, checkers, and a deck of cards. I was the oldest, and I was one that didn't like to lose. Mm. And we would play cards for candy, mainly it was M&Ms. When we got a nickel, that was a bag of M&Ms, usually 32 M&Ms in a bag. And uh, I wanted my sister's red M&Ms, which were the most valuable. And then I won her reds. I won her yellows and greens and browns. And, and so I started figuring out ways and, and maneuvers and things to do with the cards. And uh, what really cued my interest was watching Westerns, and in particular, James Garner in the TV series Maverick. And mm -hmm. he played this kind of a happy-go-lucky gambler. That he would use his wits rather than a gun to get him out of tight situations, and he'd always find himself in some gambling game against some other guy, and half the time the guy was cheated in one fashion or another, and, and uh, he would uh, use his wiles to win. And I thought, I want to be a winner. So that just kind of uh, ex <laughs> just made my desire uh, to figure out ways to come out ahead with my sisters grow. And there were other Westerns that would have episodes like mm -hmm. it was an episode of Bonanza. And uh, it was with uh, Adam Cartwright playing and they were playing heads up, stud poker and one guy had a queen up and, and Adam had a king up. And by the way, the guy raised back and forth. He goes, hold it. Best you can have is a pair of queens. Best I could have is a pair of king. You, you raised into my raise. He said, for that next card coming off the deck, the second one down is a queen. You're dealing seconds. And uh, so and I thought, dealing seconds. Hmm. But, uh, that means the second card. So anyway, I'd get little cues from the dialogue mm -hmm. within these Westerns. Nice. And I, I remember watching the documentary as well that your teacher gave you an audio recording of the expert at the card table, correct? Right. Her name was Mrs. Smith. Uh, she was, I, at that time, I thought she was maybe 150, maybe 200 years old because she was so wrinkled up, but sweet as all get out. And um, Mr. Bryan, who was the head of the VH department, he was an amateur magician and he would do tricks for us where he'd turn a stack of nickels into dimes and cut and store rope and things along those lines. And I loved that. And then I would do my card tricks for the class. And Mrs. Smith just asked me one day, why do you like cards so much? And mm -hmm. I says, well, because I can, I don't have to see what I'm, what I'm doing. I can feel what I'm doing. And so she uh, found this book at a garage sale for a nickel and now wow. that book would probably be worth uh, five thousand dollars, <laughs> uh -huh. but at that time it was just somebody's junk, 
And uh, she just recorded excerpts out of that book for me on this giant seven inch reel to reel tape recorder, probably made in the 1950s. And I think it probably weighed half as much as I did at the time. She said, <laughs> I can take it home as long as I want. And I put these rock hard headphones on and listen to these moves. And the, the parts, the main parts um, were overhand stacks. Uh, mm -hmm. And then of course, second deals, bottom deals were the main things that uh, that I worked on at that time. So um, did you, does that mean you originally started off doing card tricks before you uh, got into uh, being more of a card mechanic? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, every kid that I, well, not every kid, but I knew what we call what was called the circus trick, and then the mm -hmm. there's the math, a few mathematical ones, and uh, and then I remember as a little boy going to Disneyland with our class in elementary school, and the guy Bill Wall he got a taper deck, and mm -hmm. of course I couldn't, I didn't have the money to buy one for myself, so when I got home, I took a, well first I took my dad's file and I filed off one edge of the deck so that when a deck card was put in the other way, it'd stick out. But of course mm -hmm. I had to mangle the deck to do it. And then I tried <laughs> scissors after that. And uh, so that was uh, where I first got my interest with cards and magic. Also another places was from Bill Wall who uh, uh, got these uh, cards from Disneyland. Wow. And then yeah. like, the magic is, but the one I, uh, <laughs> I had probably the most fun with well, well, actually, um, it was, there were tricks, but I also did, the first things I did mm -hmm. uh, was add, was play extra cards, because we would play a draw poker, mm -hmm. a gin rummy rummy, and I doubt it. And uh, what I would do, like with I doubt it, you, you, you say, uh, I say you, you try to get rid of your cards first, you I'd lay down three cards and that's and you say it's three threes then someone may think you're lying they say i doubt it you turn it over it turns out to be two threes and a jack then you have to take all those cards so i started figuring out ways i would uh i'd say two twos and i'd actually lay down three cards or i would play a deal i noticed when i played draw poker i would sit there uh -huh. and just deal out hand after hand and i realized um if i dealt myself one extra card I won like 20% more often. And so I would just deal myself one extra card. And as a kid, all I had to do to do that was very simple. I'd start with myself and go around the table to the other players and end with myself. And in that process, I ended up with one extra card and I would get rid of, wow. get rid of it in the draw. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I had no idea that you were, you know, constantly thinking of these things, even oh, as, a little, you know, as, as far as back a, as I can yeah. remember. As far back as I can remember. Wow, that is that is amazing. So I guess from from there, um, after uh, you learned, I guess a bit from uh, export at the card table, you started doing, you started practicing. How did you really start refining uh, your your skills? Did you immediately start performing for people, or or what did you do from there? No, I didn't do as much performing. I did some of my uh, tri card tricks that I had mm -hmm. learned. But the mm -hmm. gambling, I never told anybody. And all through high school, mm -hmm. I, people would go, people would go, they, this is their way of saying, it. we know you're cheating, we just don't know how. Because <laughs> I was not discreet at all. I would cheat every single hand. And when, if, I, <laughs> if it was my deal and I could, I would do something to cheat that hand. And a professional <laughs> hustler would never uh, mm -hmm. work like that. It might make a move once, twice in a night, uh, when the money was significant, they would not sit there and cheat every hand. And, uh, and usually it was, like I said, by uh, dealing extra cards. And, uh, and I had some uh, basic, very simple overhand stacks and things along those lines. And, and like I said, uh, my first day of ninth grade, mm -hmm. first day of ninth grade, I'm sitting in the front, in front of the class and I, I cheated this kid next to me out of a quarter. And in <laughs> 1968, 69, a quarter for me was a lot of money. And, uh, and then the, the teacher came in and saw what I was doing, took my cards away, put me in the back of the class, and, uh, and I got in trouble. But did you get to keep the quarter? I kept the quarter. 
<laughs> I did not get that. She, she did not make me give the quarterback. She didn't know that part of it. <laughs> well, that, that is that is really cool. So um, I know you um, also from there, you went um, to the Magic Castle, correct? Uh, How did you? I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to let you finish your question. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask, how did you, you know, get into it and get into the Magic Castle? How did you get introduced to uh, Di Vernon? That's what I was going to go to. Well, I, it was 1975. I was working with Bob Yerkes, Y-E-R-K-E-S. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived with him actually from 74, 75, 76, uh, helping him train the Circus of the Stars. And we were just starting the Wonder Woman series with Linda Carter. Mm -hmm. And he was a stuntman. He has a whole circus in his backyard. And I was basically his gopher. And I was going to a theater school in Hollywood at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, a guy named John Wagner, he went by eventually, I remember when he changed his name to J.C. Wagner. And he said, uh, I, he said, Vernon would like to meet me. And that was the whole thing was to meet Professor Di Vernon. And uh, he called me up and says, Okay, I got it. I got you in. He want, he's willing to meet with you. And I was thrilled to death. He was the legend of all legends. Mm -hmm. And then he calls me up the night before and says, oh, I forgot to tell you, to get in the Magic Castle, you have to have a coat and tie. You have to have a suit. And I thought, a suit? I don't have a suit. I can't afford a suit. Where am I going to get a suit? Suit? That's for Sunday school. I don't have a suit. And I thought, <laughs> well, I wasn't going to pass up that opportunity. So... I had a friend on the on, on one of the stunt guys went down to the Northridge shopping mall in Northridge, who Bob Yerkes lived in New York, Northridge, California. And I went up this uh, in this men's store, set my cards on a coat rack. And I started thumbing through coats. And this card, this guy, a sales guy comes up to me and says, I'll cut you high card for that coat. And I thought <laughs> to myself, this is my lucky day. I said, OK. He goes, no, no, I'm just kidding. I said, tell you what, come over here. And I went over to his checkout area and there was a glass area and then a wood area. I took the wood area and I took out two twos and a queen. I said, I'll move these three cards around. If you tell me where that queen is, I'll pay double for that coat I picked out. And uh, uh, if not, you give it, give it to me for free. And he goes, really? I said, really? Well, guess what? He missed. <laughs> I don't know how he missed, but he missed. I, it could have been the way I was throwing those cards. I said, tell you what, I'll give you a chance to get your coat back. I bet the coat against a pair of pants. Then I said, okay, one more time. One more time. I bet the coat and pants against a shirt and tie. And uh, I walked out of there with a brand new suit, didn't pay a dime, went to the Magic Castle that next day. And, and just by the, for the record, I still have that coat. Size 39 regular. It was a corduroy piece of crap. It's yellow now because it was a tan color. And over this past 50 years, it's now kind of a gunky, ugly yellowish, yellowish color. And uh, anyway, I um, met Wagner and went into the Castle Library. And it was Professor Sit Vernon sitting there by himself. And on a table next to him was a guy named Tony Giorgio, who played Bruna Tattaglia in the Godfather film. And uh, John Wagner said, show, show, him, show him some of your stuff. And, and I started showing him some of my deals, seconds. And he, he goes, you know, he said, I don't, I don't care how fine your brief is. When you're dealing like that, I know you're up something. It's no good. And then Tony next door would chime in. We'll get the money. We'll get the money. Everything I would show. Every, and Tony, he wasn't even part of our group. He was just butting his big head in where it, where it didn't belong. And then I'd show something else and I'd get more criticism from Vernon. And probably the one thing they did like was my, my method for dealing studs, stud seconds. And I uh, mm -hmm. said, now that one's a little bit better because you're, you're, you're a little bit more natural in your execution. But when he first did, he actually grabbed my wrist and pinned my hand to the table. He says, now, now start dealing. That's what you want is that hand, hand needs to be dead. And mm -hmm. so that was how I initially met Vernon and uh, Giorgio. I battled with him for 39 years until the last 11 years. We became very good friends. But Vernon, uh, for some reason, took a liking to me. And he saw someone that was as nutty as, and as obsessed as he was. And so he started passing on his knowledge to me. And he spent his life, as everyone knows, chasing gamblers around the country mm -hmm. and around the world. 
like uh, Alan Kennedy back in the early 30s and, and so on. And so uh, because uh, I was, as a, like I said, as crazy as he was, and I would sit there and I would practice 14 hours a day was my average day. Yeah, sometimes I might only get 10 hours in because I was training yeah. for some fight, but there are days I'd, be, I'd have a 20 hours, have the cards in my hand 20 hours, but average is 14 hours. And over a 50 year period of time, three to 20 That's hours a day, important. seven days a week for 50 years and half of those 50 years, it was 14 hours. Anyway, so he, my point is he saw someone that was just as nutty as he was and he would give me a, 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 a challenge or assignment says, this is how it really should be done. And he'd show me and then I would, the next time he'd see me, I'm doing it. And he couldn't do it. I didn't know he couldn't do it. I thought he could do it. And so he started telling me things in ways that he couldn't do, but it's the way he wished they could be done. And it was only after I spent those thousands of hours and uh, then I'd come back and he would just go, that's it. That's it. Wow. So I'm, I, I'm curious. So he, so uh, Vernon, he, um, told you how a move should be done or how, how did he exactly show you how the move um, that he, he, he would perceive as, as being done? Well, he, he, Vernon believed in naturalness. Here's mm -hmm. a really odd statement that he would say that people have no idea. They think, well, he's just a crazy old man. Vernon says it takes seven years just to properly pick up a deck of cards. And 99% of them just said, oh, that's a crit. What is seven years to pick up a deck? Seven years, man, I can do 1,500 double lifts in that time, <laughs> not different, whatever. And, uh, and his point was people are so unnatural in their actions and they tip themselves off right away, particularly magicians in, in the way they go to execute their moves because they're trying to cover their little move with a bigger move and they in the actions right. of trying to cover it up all they're doing is creating more more um unnaturalness in their action which becomes a, another tip off so he would uh tell me richard the fingers all to be on the side of the deck you need to just hold that deck just lay it in your hands a, a said a four-year-old can just take a card and deal it off so when mm -hmm. you're dealing a second it needs to be just as simple with no effort at all just like you're the you know, like i said you're just taking the card off there should be no effort and uh and so i believed he could do it and i would actually check out his hands i'd feel his hands he'd show me the positions and uh, he wasn't executing he'd just be telling me where the fingers need to be and then i'd go and practice it like that and only to find out that oh no one else could do it like that that's the way he wished he could do it and it was I had 17 years of him doing that to me. And it was, of course, uh, uh, it was a few years, well, a few, few number of years later that he admitted to me that those, those I'll just use the word assignments, mm -hmm. challenges might be a better word, he gave me. He didn't think they were possible. He just wanted to see, it up, see what I'd come up with. And then finally, wow. he, he thought they were just very, very nice, put it simply. So so do you think if he had told you that this is not something he could do, you would still have pushed as hard to get them done? I don't think so, because I believed he could do it. I believe he was showing me. And, and, and then there was the thing is he did show me some very good stuff. But when mm -hmm. he would want to modify the way he did it to the way he wished he could do it, there were, mm -hmm. there were subtle differences, subtle uh, position, finger positions, hand positions, hand actions that changed it from a very, from a little bit contrived method to a way that would be dis, to disarming to even some of the most sophisticated professionals. So I don't wow. think I would have, I, I would, what, I, what would have happened is I would have just did what he was already doing or what everyone else was already doing. That's what would have probably happened. Wow. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it, it really just was, uh, I guess maybe even a blessing that he he hadn't uh, told you any of that. Oh, big time! Yeah, oh yeah, big time. And 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 anybody out there, and I, of course, I I know your audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of them know me, and they have probably seen me deal seconds and everything. And so, the educated person out there knows what knows what I'm talking about. And and it's the difference is very obvious. 
when you mm -hmm. look at a particular way my moves are executed mm -hmm. versus the way you'll see 99% of the other uh, persons execute those, uh, attempt those same type of moves. Exactly, yeah. When I, when I actually first started um, learning different game way techniques and, and after watching a documentary for the first time, I think it was uh, maybe two to three months ago is when I saw it for the first time. That's, that's uh, when you talked about the, the, the naturalness and the four-year-old can deal off uh, a single card from, from a deck of cards. And that's really what got me just, it kind of just flipped my world upside down because I was like, oh, I, I know how to do this now. But after watching this, it's, I've been doing it wrong this whole time. So it was kind of, Yep, it was just this relearning that that I had to do, which I'm very, very grateful for. Yeah, and uh, I, I, have, well, I have kind of a saying that I'll tell people. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, practice makes perfect. No, mm -hmm. perfect practice makes perfect. You can Absolutely. practice something wrong, and when you're done, it's perfectly wrong. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen it over the past 45, 50 years. Many times I've been in the martial arts. I just had my... 50th anniversary on May, March 5th, oh, my first day in the martial arts and all, all the years of training and training others, somebody will sit there and say they swoop their sidekick up instead of pick it up and shooting it in like a, like a jab, they'll swoop it into mm -hmm. the thing. And they've sat there and practiced like that hundreds of times, thousands of times, maybe one year, two years, three years. And in the process, they've practiced it wrong and they have it now perfectly wrong. And then they have to totally re or relearn that that technique. Saying the same thing applies with the cards. They'll have or someone will have uh, learned a, a particular move, uh, mm -hmm. uh, second, bottom, whatever, and and they go, oh gosh, uh, yeah, sitting there doing this, that's perfectly wrong. I was with Slidini and Professor. We used to hang. The three mm -hmm. of us used to hang out together, and. One time we were at Taga, where were we? I think we were at the Aladdin Casino. I don't even think the Aladdin's around anymore. But uh, slide in, he says, Richard, take those cards in and move your hands back and forth. He said, it really obfuscate the action and really hide it. And, and Professor says, don't listen to him, Richard. He doesn't know the way of a gambler. That's unnatural. <laughs> it's totally unnatural. Don't, Tony does not know anything about the gambling world. Just, I just don't listen to him. So it was just kind of funny to have a legend, Tony Slidini, saying mm -hmm. one thing. And Vernon, of course, Vernon was never one to hold back. He reprimanded Tony very loud <laughs> and very uh, firmly you know, to him uh, right there in front of me, which that's just the way Vernon was, which, which I was glad because, you know, I, I respected Tony and um, what Tony was saying. Sure, it makes it uh, far harder to see, but mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like, but you're drawing all kinds of attention to yourself and the person's going, I don't know what the heck you're doing, but you must, you must be doing something there because <laughs> nobody deals like that. That action is like, obscene be like the, what we used to call necktie dealers you know they raise it up so that you can't see the top of the deck when they're going dealer second i said sometimes yep. they bring it so high that i it could be coming out of the bra for all you know <laughs> you know it's, it's actually really funny that you say that because when i uh, initially started doing things like that um i started doing the um i think the first type of second deal i did was the the strike second deal where you actually bring your arm up and you push off that one card and then you grab the the single card behind it and i even remember watching in i, I forgot if it was one of your interviews or, or, or watching something but you even mentioned about the thumbs crossing and how that was so unnatural if you're pushing the That's card out why would you um cross thumbs? why would you cross it why would you push over a card and yeah. bypass that card bypass your thumb to take the next card. It's like yeah. trying to touch your nose by wrapping <laughs> your head, your hand around your neck. You know, it, it's, it's an illogical movement and there's, it's almost impossible to do us uh, uh, to not do that. And when you're doing a strike second, I mean, mm -hmm. I have a, a method called what is called side second, but it's my own uh, version from a move that Vernon saw a guy named uh, Dad Stevens do back in 1919. And it was mm -hmm. called a side second. And that one doesn't have the, uh, the leaking and the unnatural action as does the, 
uh, almost every uh, stripe segment mm -hmm. that you'll see people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then For here's me, the funny I thing is, people sit there and they spend all this time developing their second deal. Yep. And, and then they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> they don't know how to put it to its purpose. I have a friend that's been working on my particular, my move for 30 years. And yet, you know, okay, other than just using it as a show-off demonstration of watching deal in seconds or, or, or maybe uh, uh, your account, mm -hmm. you know, a trick, you, know, you say seven and their card's the fourth, and you deal three more seconds or two more seconds to get the seventh card. But other than that, they don't know how to put it to its purpose. And uh, we're in my show, the second deal is my most used of all the moves that I do. I use the second deal on all 60% of what I do in my show depends oh, wow. on the second deal, but, but the rest of them don't know how to put it to its purpose. Wow. I, I had, I had no idea that you use the second deal that much in your, in your shows. Oh, I know uh, uh, every, every other demonstration I do in there, the second deals involved. And the, wow. another thing about a second of all the different deals you know, they always talk about the legendary middle deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's the, the ultimate, the most difficult. Yeah. I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. When you're doing a bottom deal, great deal, or middle deal. Yeah. When you're dealing around the table, it's honest, 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 dishonest. Honest, 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 dishonest. So if mm -hmm. it's a bottom deal, honest, 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 dishonest. It's a great deal, honest, 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 dishonest. Middle deal, honest, 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 dishonest. Mm -hmm. With a second, it might be honest, dishonest, dishonest, honest. Honest, right. honest, dishonest, dishonest, honest, honest. Honest, 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 dishonest. Dishonest, 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 dishonest. So the chances of breaking rhythm are a thousand times more likely because there's no rhythm with mm -hmm. it because the, when you put it to its purpose, you don't know when you're going to be going into those seconds. And so that's where people, uh, that's why, you know, putting a second deal to its purpose is far mm -hmm. harder uh, at, at the card table. Now for performing right. card magic, but it's a card table. If you're trying to deal out hands using mm -hmm. a second deal, other than maybe just killing a card, peeking a card and killing it in a, 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 in a one time uh, yeah. hit, like in a blackjack, you just want to bust, bust them out. They're sitting on, a 16, the top cards are five, uh, or the second card down is five. You do want them to have that five, whatever, you know, that, you know, something like that. That's relatively more doable, mm -hmm. but uh, you're not going to, uh, you know, if you're going to be doing a performance, mm -hmm. you're not going to get away with just controlling a, pat uh, a pair of aces to your hand. That's not going to be acceptable. It's, it, it's all, that's all you needed a game of five stud. Or, mm -hmm. you know, as an opener, uh, but in a, in a, if you're performing, you know, the audience is not going to be impressed with that. You have to fill your hand every time. You know, and when I say fill mm -hmm. your hand, you better have a, at least an ace high straight, a flush, a full house, four of a kind. You know, otherwise it's not a show. And put, and then to put, and then the, the moves to make that happen, uh, there's a lot of seconds involved, at least in, in, my, in my demonstrations. And like when I deal out blackjack, I'll deal, deal the whole deck. And I'll let the players, the audience choose how many players each time. And they're mm -hmm. playing their own hands. They're deciding hit, stay, double down, whatever they want to do. And, uh, and you know, and I'll, I'll win every single hand. But that, that's, a, you know, just in that one demonstration, I'll have done half the half of those deals off that deck. Or probably more than half were not honest. Well, I, I, well, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, um, I've seen you perform and it just, it still blows my mind every single time. And it just kind of instills in me that I still have a long, long way to go, but it's just, it's, it's absolutely incredible just seeing, um, seeing those performances. I mean, of course I, I still have no idea, no clue how it's done. I try to break it down. I, I actually, when I, um, when I first started learning, I, I uh, learned my um, push through riffle shuffle just literally by breaking down like frame by frame, some of your uh, performances. And that's how you learn it too. And that's mm -hmm. how I, when I create something, I first, I figure what is my objective? Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's, a, okay, and if it relates to the table, card table, uh, where is it in play? 
What am I trying to mimic? What actions am I trying to replicate, but, they're, but I'm replicating them falsely? Mm-hmm. And I break it down piece by piece, whatever that move is. And I'm, okay, uh, I'll say a second deal, which is not breaking down a move. move. But if, right. like when I do a second deal, I'll, I'll realize, okay, my thumb must apply the precise amount of pressure to push over exactly 22 six thousandths of an inch every time I deal a card, okay? Every time I deal, I have to have two exact cards lined up as one. So Mm -hmm. that feel right there alone, that took a lot of years to do. And then when I'm dealing that second, when when my thumb's coming across that deck, when it's Mm -hmm. coming across the deck, because it's not a strike where there's all kinds of exposure of the card to to hit, to, to get a hold of, when I'm dealing it, I have, we have it, we've taken these slow motion cameras that deal many hundreds of frames in a second. And mm-hmm. we've uh, calculated it down to a, I'm, it ta- I'm hitting that card in about five microseconds to, hit, wow. uh, to engage that card. I just did it for you right there. And, and, you know, in, the, in the time I'm bre- passing by this medium right there, five microseconds, it takes a thousand microseconds to equal one second. So that's like less than a blink of an eye. A blink of an eye is more time than the, the instant that I'm going across that card and engaging. So, and the, but that's, that is why you have, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I guess my question would be, how did you approach learning uh, these types of moves? Just what I, I was saying, I, I, just what I was saying. Uh, what is my objective? Okay. Mm. How do I want to shift the cards? I have a dozens of ways of uncutting the deck. I'll figure out, well, how, how can I do that move uh, in a more natural position? Or names like this one hand chef was just a, this bizarre looking thing. I thought, well, that is totally unnatural. How can I do that? That same move where I just, I just throw the cards in my hand and then I'm able to sh- shift those cards um, uh, and I start and stop in the same, in the same dealing position. You know, mm-hmm. So I would break down the move, analyze it, figure out what my fingers have to do to make that happen. And then I would just do it slow motion over and over and over till every exact element of that muscle memory is firmly embedded in my brain. Mm-hmm. And then I turn it into a subconscious habit. And I'm one of those hyper persons. If I would have grown up 50 years, if I would have grown up today, the way I was mm. 50 years ago, they would have put me on all those drugs. Those <laughs> drugs that they do to, sub, sub, to try to turn little boys into little girls, you know? You know, <laughs> boys that want to jump and, and fight and Superman and everything else. You know, I was just hyper kid and I have an uh, unlimited amount of energy. I was just, I would, they called me Gilligan when I was a kid or they called me a perpetual motion machine. And like I said, if I, I, they would have probably tried seducing me, seducing, sedacing, sedacing <laughs> with that too. <laughs> I may have liked that one. No, <laughs> sedating me if I was, uh, uh, if I grew up today. And, but I, anyway, my point is, is I would take that nervous energy that people waste. Like you yeah. see people just sitting there tapping their, sitting on their chair, tapping their fingers at their desk tapping their mm-hmm. toe, taking their pen and just, uh, you know, flipping it, tear their thumb and twiddling. All that is idle energy that's being wasted. Mm-hmm. I took all that idle energy and I just focused it down onto my fingers where the deck of cards were. And I would sit there and take that move, whatever it was, turn it into a subconscious habit. And I would sit there and practice over and over. And then eventually it became a subconscious habit where I would be practicing, I'm in the movie theater, I'm sitting in the car, I'm uh, grocery shopping, whatever it happens to be, I was practicing that movie. I wouldn't be, I would be totally unaware that I was doing it. And then maybe six months go by, a year goes by on that particular uh, one hand shift that you you can even do upside down. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, It was two and a half years later, I went, I got it. You know, and uh, so, but it's, wow. but in that interim, on that particular move at that time, where I was putting in maybe three to four hours a day on just that one mm-hmm. odd move. Um, my point is that I turn it into a subconscious habit, so I'm practicing it. 
uh, when I'm doing any and uh, every other thing that I would be doing throughout the course of a day. So I'm not wasting that yeah. time. I'm always doing at least two or three things simultaneously. As we're sitting here talking, I am still practicing uh, <laughs> different moves. And uh, other than when we bring to a conscious uh, thought because yeah. we're talking about it, you know, do I stop and recognize and realize what I'm what I'm doing? But other than that, uh, uh, you know, I just I, I, I my my hands automatically go into their uh, subconscious uh, mode where that idle energy is being uh, u- utilized to uh, to continue to develop the different moves and or in yeah. this case as me as an old man to sustain those moves. <laughs> So are there, are there certain, uh, I guess, is there a certain agenda that you set for yourself in terms of what moves you have to practice daily, or is it just uh, whatever comes subconsciously? It, oh, yeah. Oh, that, that's a good question, actually. Very good question. Um, it's both. It depends mm-hmm. on what the situation. If I'm working on something new, then that's where my focus is. And then um, I will uh, I'll break it up. Like right now, I, I just went into my, my um, default move. My default move is when I'm standing there, I'll deal a second, put it in the middle of the deck, deal a second, put it in the middle of the deck, deal a second, put it in the middle of the deck. So I'm just doing, I'll, I'll do that over and over and over. And like right before a show, I like to do at least, I do about 3,600 second deals before a show, almost before every show. Wow. Um, that, and that, that's how many, how many seconds deals I'll do in a one hour period it is about 3,600. And um, so that, 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 that's something that is set because to have my hands feel comfortable mm-hmm. and, and that my actions smooth and, and any nervousness that I may have, be, you know, getting ready to go on stage, depending on if it's for a hundred or a thousand or 5,000 people, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, 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 and then another element is the weather, you know, if it's yeah. hot, cold, sweaty, and my, you know, my hands clammy, all the, that's the second it, that's the first issue is the hands, the touch, and making sure they're properly tuned up. And then the next thing is the deck of cards, making sure that it is uh, tuned up and it's a, a good quality deck and my hands feel good with it. And, I, and I'm so fussy. <laughs> I, uh, my, we have a little half chihuahua, half poodle, uh, uh-huh. chipu dog and when it, we were having our trainer train it just to do the normal heel sits say all that stuff um but we tell her oh here's our leash and she goes no i use my i'm a leash snob that was her words i'm a leash snob i have to use my leash and i thought <laughs> hmm i must be a card snob <laughs> because i will have i mean if, if we went back right behind here and i pulled out for the ball if I show you the room right behind the door right behind me, there's 10,000 extra cards sitting in there and all just stacked from the, almost the floor to the ceiling. And um, uh, I'll, I'll take, I'll, they're all from the same run, all according to my specifications when those cards were made um, with a caliper, I like a 10 point, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 11 point, 11.1 to 11.5 thousandths even though those those tens of thousands are really really um, hard to to calibrate, and uh, wow. so and then with a certain embossing level and a certain depending on which punches they went through the mm-hmm. smoothness of the deck. Also, in other words, my my point is all these decks were made at the same time, but yet I'll take that. I don't like that one. And I'll say, ah, ooh, oh my gosh, my fingers! I have a little mini orgasms going. Ooh, yes, yes. This deck I like. This is the one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yeah, that's actually what I was what I was actually gonna ask, what I was gonna ask you about is um, how do you prepare prepare your hands for performing? Because I know for me, sometimes it's my hands are just very dry. I can't get any grip on the deck. Other times they're just perfect. Everything goes super smoothly. So how do you control uh, control that? That is the question every card man in the world wants the answer to. And, um, and, and in the curse of a card man, it's getting old and your hands dry down on you. The professor used to complain about it all, all the time. He would say, mm. I retired 40 years ago. I can't do anything anymore. 
but yet he could do beautiful stuff. That was just his way of saying, go away. <laughs> to those he wanted to get rid of. But anyway, um, and that was the thing is uh, uh, we're always constantly looking for the next, the perfect lotion. Uh, to, and what I do, and I have my own, I have a formula and I'm pretty reg regimented, uh, regimented on it. Mm. And what it is, uh, is I will uh, get my hands really hot, hot. Mm -hmm. I can take a shower and I put them in really hot water and that opens the pores up. And I have this lotion. I don't know the I don't know the name of it. I I mm. have it where I can email it to people because they say, "Tell us what it is." And uh, <laughs> I, I all I think, if I remember right, has does have triple aniline and, and uh, has a mango smell to it. But anyway, I've tested lotions from all over the world, and this is the one I got I got from these Vietnamese um, at nail salon and salon. And I buy it by the gallon now, and I have, I have at least five gallons on hand, even though it takes me a long time to go through five gallons. But <laughs> get to the point, you get your hands really, really hot. That opens up the pores. Then what I do is I take and I saturate, I cover my hands with lotion. I don't rub it in. That has a different effect on mm -hmm. your hands. You let it absorb into those pores. I will let my hands sit. In fact, I do, I do this every day, multiple times during the day. I lay out a towel across my lap, cover my hands with lotion, and then this is where I will, maybe I'll rehearse a script of some kind mm -hmm. so that my hands are tied up. And, mm -hmm. and at night when I sleep, if I can't sleep, put my towel down, put my hands up, and I look, I look like this. <laughs> it just it puts me right to sleep. And I'm yet I'm sitting there with my hands frozen. Uh, like a like a Frankenstein or something because they can't touch anything because they're covered with lotion and that absorbs into those pores and then before a show to get uh, answer your be specific in the area where you'd be uh, wanting to know what how it can help you is before a show I do that and then once they soaked in for about twenty or thirty minutes then I'll rub the rest of it in and what I sometimes will do if I just want to speed it up a little bit. Is I blow on my hands and that cool that closes the pores, which seals in the motion. And that way my hands are good. When I do that process, they're good for about two to four hours of good dealing. And that's and that, that will cover um, pretty much any show that I'm doing. Now if I'm doing the Magic Castle where I do four shows and it might be a, over a four hour period. Maybe after the second show, I might just do a touch up. I say touch up, I'll just go ahead and just do a regular motion uh, job. <laughs> and then I'll do this. I'll sit, but I'd sit for a few, five minutes and then blow on it and uh, mm -hmm. to get those pores to close, to, to suck in and hold in the moisture and then rub out the rest and wipe off residuals with a, with a towel, not a paper towel. Mm -hmm. Paper towels uh, suck moisture out of your hands. It's like wood. I never touch wood before a show, you know, mm -hmm. cause you touch wood, that it just sucks the moisture right out and paper towels uh, will be more inclined to do that than a cloth uh, towel. So little teeny things, but those are just things over the years I've learned. And, and when I talk about lotions, I used to smuggle in turtle, sea turtle lotion for a number of years, but it was really became too labor, too impractical because I'd have mm. to sneak it across the border. Um, even though you get a bottle that tall for like two to three bucks, it's just that uh, you have to smuggle it in the country because mm. they said sea turtles are an endangered species. And yet when you go to the Cayman Islands and they said, will you tell those people in the United States sea turtles are not endangered? We have 100,000 sea turtles right here on display by itself. Right here is 100,000 sea turtles. They're not endangered. Anyway, so that was why they're, why that sea turtle lotion is, was banned in the United States. Mm. And then I another know. time I went to baby lotion, which is pretty good. Because um, you want a lotion that has no oil in it. That's the thing. You want like woman's face lotion. And, uh, but a baby lotion has no oil in it. But the problem with that was, is well, it, it was actually good and bad. The good, at least with the women, is I smell like a baby's butt. 
And the, but and the girls knew what it was. The guys didn't know what was going on. They didn't. They didn't know. They didn't know the smell coming from you know. That was they said you it smelled like a baby's butt. You know after it was you know, not before after it was <laughs> after clean. It was clean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, and so but the women, the girls liked it. They didn't know where it was coming from, and the guys just didn't know where it was coming from. And they didn't. But so it was kind of funny. So I, this actually leads me to, to one of my last questions. I want to start winding down. Um, so uh, when, when we're talking about doing shows. When did you first get into uh, performing performing and, and doing shows? And this is this something that you aspired to do uh, when you started doing card tricks or uh, gambling techniques? Oh, yes. In fact, I started as a professional performer in, in 1972 with a mm-hmm. theater company. I was with them for for. For six, seven years till mm-hmm. seventy-eight, and all, during that time, I was working with those cards, and I already had everything planned out: what I was going to do, and where I was going to go. And people would tell me, particularly my ex-wife's father, "There's no mm-hmm. way you can make a living with cards." And and his, her mother would say, hey, "You're gonna, my my daughter's gonna starve to death, and all this stuff." And then. But, you know, years later, she's she she go. I always knew you were going to be successful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you telling me I was going to starve your daughter to death anyway. But um, so I I had it planned out, and I you know that's a whole lot of topics in one question there. To if I if I start elaborating on that, but yeah, yeah, I had it planned out, and I started performing. Started seventy nine doing strictly gambling demonstrations, and I performed seven nights a week for six years straight 200 no 2190 days in a row and then wow. uh, and that was bit you know and and back then we didn't have projection so you mm-hmm. had to to maintain your position you have to have you have to create an added value for your client you can't just be the close-up magician uh, entertaining the the people that's the you know eventually your your first year all you're not gonna make enough money mm-hmm. uh, to sustain yourself uh, uh, at least the way it works now back then I was the highest paid person in the company um, wow. but that was because of the added value I got my client the reason mm-hmm. why my ran, ran my engagement ran so long is I got them on national and international publicity. I got them all kinds of media coverage, um, just any worldwide television shows. And so because of that, um, that's why the run was so long. In fact, I had did a number mm-hmm. of specials for Japan and I became one of the 10 top attractions in the United States. My come to see my show um, uh, for these Japanese tour groups, these buses. And so that, when these That's bus loads of people coming in with wallets full of money, that was a big advantage. That was a big benefit to my client. So that's what I mean by becoming an added value. It has to mm-hmm. be above and beyond what you're providing as far as just from an entertainment standpoint. Wow. That's, that's truly just incredible. And wow. that was one of the shows that I was on on the boat. It was on That's Incredible. That was, they filmed that 40 years ago in 1980, <laughs> 1981. That means I'm getting old, but I'm still, I have, uh, I, I leave, uh, actually I leave to Sunday, a friend of mine named Adam Shire, he's the one who invented Siri and uh, he's coming in and we're going to hop a private jet and uh, go on an adventure together. And uh, I'm doing a, a secret show for uh, some special people. So, and, well, that sounds amazing. Yeah, and but anyway, but uh, and then last week I was in Vail, Colorado, another billionaire's house. Um, I spent all of September in Russia filming television specials, and Russia's borders are slammed shut. I was actually escorted into Russia by President Putin's deputy prime minister, Volodykov. Wow. I can't say his name very well, and uh, so that's how I got into Russia. And uh, but and then also during uh, COVID, I something that your your viewers might want to follow is my Mm -hmm. life story you're asking about you can actually read it and it's free i i spent uh gosh actually here's another day i spent four thousand hours 
of times. I have this thing about numbers. They just mm. happen to roll in my head. Uh, so I spent 10 to 17 hours a day for almost a year uh, um, when I wasn't performing. Even when I was in Russia, I was still putting in about eight, eight 10 hours a day on this project. Um, writing, I, what I did, I took my biography with in conjunction with John Rockerbomber, or everyone knows Rock, mm-hmm. Rockerbomber, has written more, all kinds of magic books and millions of words in different magic publications and so forth. Wonderful man, dear friend. And, uh, but he put everything I ever did in my life in third person. He wanted it in first person. So during mm-hmm. COVID, I put it in first person and uh, put it in 427 bite sized pieces. So you can just read a little episode, and at the end of each one, is a video clip. I had to cut out 427 videos, and it might wow. be when I was on this show or that show or or, or a move here or something, you know. So it, it's it's all free. Just RichardTurner52.com is where you can watch it. But it was kind of yep. my kind of my gift to the magic world and the gambling world and the in the world of cards and those that want something that's kind of inspiring, motivating, and dramatic and other things depending on what what part. Uh, you're reading that awesome yeah I, I actually saw it today um i went out i went to your website right before we had a chance to talk and i didn't i didn't realize the blog section was there earlier because i haven't been on for for a couple months but i realized the blog section there and i clicked on it and I'm, i thought maybe it was you know maybe an older blog or something like that and i went on and it actually had i think the last one was today's date i believe today yeah, or yesterday's you go monday through date. friday a different episode goes up monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So five days a week, and it'll take 85 weeks for it to play out. And it started going up February 1st. So we're into about our awesome. it's two and a half months. It's been two and a half months worth of episodes. So are all the episodes um, pretty much completed, or is this something that? Oh, yeah, no, it's um, all the way. It's, I, I, I finished the entire project all the way. All 85 episodes are in the can. All Amazing. Uh, up on Google Drive, ready to be downloaded and, and and stood up when that day comes for it. And then we even set it where is it, John Rocket Run? Is this the end? No, as the story goes on, because we have um, I've signed a deal um, mm-hmm. to turn my life into a A list major motion picture, and uh, we should have some. Uh, interesting in news probably maybe next next week and as far as the funding oh. goes it's going to be funded partly out of uh, Singapore and Hong Kong will be the executive producers and, um, and wow. uh, anyway the people that uh, were looking at playing me <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to tease my wife all of you all, all <laughs> must say you know my wife uh, she's married too, and I can't uh-huh. say the name because I can't say the name. <laughs> when, it, when, the, when the knowledge is out there, I'm going to tease her to death. <laughs> wow, that is that is incredible. Um, do you have any idea on when would be the expected release of that uh, film? Uh, it, it, it could probably be about two years, just knowing how things go. But it, uh, if this. If the initial the initial funding transfers over, and it's supposed to be before the end of April, which is the next ten days or so, then things will start moving pretty quickly. And mm-hmm. uh, and there's the crews, you know, the film crews because of COVID. That's what's really slowing things down. And in Hollywood right now, the film crews is really just yeah. hard to get. And in Atlanta, in Georgia, they have some very very fine film crews there, but with this political stuff that's going on over there. Um, some of those crews are, um, they're just, ha- I would say they're having political troubles because of the mm-hmm. political climate in that, in that state, which is totally unnecessary. And But there's three really top crews in New Mexico, which is the other uh, place. And then there's, uh, there's some top crews in Chicago and also in Austin. So, you know, because when you go, you're going to have to have a, there's a whole team that you that that's what they'll do they'll have all the cameras and the crew and the tech and everything there so they're that will cool. that it, it, it'll be dependent upon uh, who is ready to rock and roll and awesome. uh, not tied up and hopefully we grab one uh, because uh, things are starting to un, starting to lighten up a little bit mm-hmm. uh, and so there are a lot of people with projects and we want to we want to get one of those a-list crews too 
I see. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm dying to watch it. I can't. I don't, I don't know if I'll be able to wait for a full two years, but I'm telling you, I'm very, very yeah. excited. I'm very looking forward yeah. to watching it. Yeah, so it'll, one, be, it'll be interesting. But once again, yeah, I remember Hollywood is Hollywood. Hollywood is <laughs> full of C R A P, but uh, no one thought Delt would have been produced. It was produced. All the other things weren't produced, but it happened. So mm -hmm. we'll just watch and see what happens. Awesome. And one one final question, and uh, maybe hopefully it'll be real quick. Um, what are your final thoughts and maybe your biggest tip for someone who would want to become a card mechanic? First, figure out why do you want to become a card mechanic? What's your reason? Now, uh, most uh, traditionally, a mechanic was somebody who's at the table quietly taking money, taking the money, getting the money, ste stealing, cheating. That's the that's the traditionally the reason for a mechanic and what a mechanic is and what a mechanic does. Mm. You figure out what's your reason. If your reason is for the card table, um, you better make sure you know the the etiquette of the game really well. You better be a darn good player straight, because uh, because when you you're gonna be moving on a game, uh, you're not you're not gonna be moving that often. And, uh, you know, with the risk, depending on what state you're playing, and you play in Texas, man, they break you up. And uh, so it depends what your, your reason is. If you're talking about for entertainment, okay, um, make sure you, you're different, you're unique, you are unique. There's a whole lot of people, particularly in particular, particularly in the magician area, there's so many copycats of the, the, they see somebody do this and there's, Somebody they'll they'll try to figure out the thing and the next day they're trying to perform it. And that's why way back when I wanted to make my stuff so difficult that I didn't have a bunch of copycats. And so you have to figure out why do you want to do it? If you want to for performance, for performing, I'll tell you this: the gambling work has an emotional appeal on people. And Vernon would say, if you want to uh, be long-lasting, you have to have an emotional appeal on people. When it comes to magic and uh, in the areas where the real money is, and, and that's for me, that's the, the corporate thing. You know, I get, I get five figures for an hour show and um, uh, that, uh, well, 40 minutes to an hour show, even though I try to I'll inch them out to seven minutes, I'd really rather have 70. But my point is that um, uh, I lost my point. <laughs> What's your reason for doing it? Why do you want to do it? And the real big money is in the corporate area. And when magicians, they'll have, they say they hire a magician. The businessman, now I'm going to go back 40 years. Now it's a little different because of politically correct crap. But that, you go back 40, 50 years, there were two things that entertained the men. Gambling, girls. If it, mm -hmm. if it wasn't one of those two options, they want to get back to talking about business. The only thing that they would that would would be enough to divert their attention from their business was what I can be cheated at cards because that has an emotional appeal to people. In that, all most of these people will gamble. They have their twice a tr twice a year trip to Vegas with their company, or they have their weekly poker game, or they grew up playing gin rummy or rummy mm -hmm. or they have their bridge and everybody wonders can i be cheated when i go to vegas are they taking my money and of course the answer is they're not they don't need to they will just tell you to get lost if they don't like you and so they're trying to <laughs> cheat you they say go play somewhere else and anyway uh, so they don't that it's the safest place to play but my point is people have that emotional appeal going i knew they were cheating me so it, it gets people all excited or so they, they that's one area where it has an emotional appeal on people the other is they go dollars 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 They're, can will you come with me to my poker game we can i go to with you to las vegas so it has an emotional appeal on people mm -hmm. above and beyond of just someone doing, watching some coin jump from one hand to the other. They go, well, that's clever. That's amusing. I want to get back to business, you know, real money, real, where real money is. So mm -hmm. that's why the gambling has an emotional appeal for people um, when you're do if that's your intention is for the purposes of performance. And that's why I've had a, uh, uh, nonstop for 40 years. I have over 40, 42 years now 
uh, since I performed just strictly gambling stuff without stopping. I actually, for 27 years, I performed five to seven days a week for 27 years straight. And then I, and then I, I thought at 50 That's years old, everyone else retires. So I thought, I'm going to retire. And then, it turned, and then, as my friend said, you're the busiest retired guy. I know all that. And then it's <laughs> now all of a sudden, I, 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 I'm laughing, but it just became even more. The demand even went up, which is good because I don't, mm -hmm. I, it's fine. And, but, that, but once again, you have to figure out why do you want to do it? What's your reason? Exactly. What's your reason? What's your purpose? Entertainment, cheating. And, mm -hmm. then you better, and then you have to figure out how you're going to implement it and how you're going to apply it. And are you trying to do it to make a living or for your own satisfaction? A lot of people do it for their own satisfaction. You know, they just like, they, they're just card ones. They just enjoy the uh, trying to practice the moves like someone just practicing jump shots. They know they're never going to be in the NBA, uh, mm -hmm. but they just want to practice these, uh, these shots, you know, the basketball or football or golf putt or drive or whatever. So it depends on what your purpose is. And uh, like I said, yeah. some people just do it for their own, own entertainment and their own challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's a really nice way to challenge yourself because mm -hmm. you don't have to, you don't need anybody. All you need is 52 pieces of paper. Wow. Amazing. Well, Richard, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. Thank you so much for being on. Um, for everyone watching, I'll put all of uh, Richard's information down in the description below to link to his website, Instagram, all that good stuff. So Richard, absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, thank you everyone for joining me at the card table and I'll see you next time. See you next time. Huge shout out to Richard Turner for being on today. It was an absolute pleasure. I'll put the links down to his uh, YouTube website, Instagram, all that stuff down in the description. Make sure you go ahead and check it out. And if you want to see some more bonus footage with Richard, I'll put the link to that in the description as well. That's all we got. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time at the card table.